Welcome to the Food Junkies podcast. Here, we aim to bring you the experience, strength, and hope of professionals working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. Our mission is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a recognized disorder. Here, we discuss all things recovery, exploring the many pathways people take towards abstinence in order to achieve a health-forward lifestyle. We hope to inspire you to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, and share your journey with others. And hopefully the message will spread. Is there a role for psychedelics in the treatment of food addiction? Welcome to the Food Junkies podcast. I am your co-host today, along with Molly Payne Today, we speak with Dr. Matthew Johnson. Dr. Johnson is Senior Investigator at Shepherd Pratt Center for Excellence in Psilocybin Research and Treatment. After getting his PhD in experimental psychology at the University of Vermont in 2004, he became one of the world's most published scientists on the use of psychedelics for addiction. Dr. Johnson served as the 2019 president of the Psychopharmacology and Substance Abuse Division of the American Psychological Association and is current president of the International Society for the Research on Psychedelics. He is principal investigator on funded studies investigating psilocybin in the treatment of opioid dependence and PTSD. Dr. Johnson has been interviewed widely by media about psychedelics and other drugs, to name only a few of the media outlets, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, the Atlantic, Vanity Fair, Scientific American, Nature, and Psychology Today. Dr. Johnson has appeared for interviews on numerous television and radio shows, including 60 Minutes, BBC World Service, NPR's Morning Edition. He is cited in Michael Pollan's best-selling book, How to Change Your Mind, What the New Science of Psychedelics Teaches Us About Consciousness, Dying, Addiction, Depression, and Transcendence. We at Food Junkies are thrilled to have Dr. Johnson on the podcast to discuss the role that psychedelics may play in addiction, particularly food addiction. So welcome, Matthew. Oh, thanks very much, Vera. Pleasure to be with you both. Thanks for having me. We'd like to get into the personal side of things. What got you interested in the field of psychedelics and then into how that might apply for mental illness and addiction? Two basic threads. As in my undergraduate college work, I became academically interested in behavioral psychology, sort of Skinnerian psychology, the role of consequences and on behavior and how to shape behavior change, I would say generally. And on the other hand, an interest in psychopharmacology or the effects of psychoactive drugs. So I did some cocaine research as an undergraduate and eventually published it. But I was just interested in everything how anything legal, illegal does caffeine, alcohol, nicotine, cocaine, just all of the psychoactive drugs, like how throwing these molecules into the brain can have at at times really profound changes in mind and behavior. And so that was my main interest. And then just even outside of the research or academic school world, just coming of age and learning about the the history of the role of psychedelics, particularly in the 60s, and meeting people who have used these things, and they say some just some very different things about them. So I learned about the history of using LSD for alcoholism back in the 60s, and it really discovered, oh, this wasn't, wasn't as if it was concluded that this didn't work, or this was so dangerous, this can't be used. It was really just the politics shifted. And so as someone, I would say, just generally interested in drugs and behavior, broadly speaking, the good, the bad, the ugly, pharmacology, behavioral pharmacology can go under different names. But if you're interested in drugs and behavior change or drugs and behavior, I like to say either you're, you've got to be interested in these psychedelics or you don't know much about them because they are just very different. And they have this really interesting history or prehistory, I should say, and a number of different indigenous cultures used in a very sacramental way. A lot of drugs have been used in a sacramental way, alcohol, cocaine, tobacco, but nonetheless, relatively speaking, more so, more exclusively, it was very rare for these drugs to be used recreationally. And then again, you look at some of the claims that just anecdotally in our culture where you just, there's no other, even with something like cannabis, 
yeah, there's plenty of therapeutic claims, and I think many of them are, are, are real, but I've never met anyone who's even claimed that they used cannabis once or twice, like 30 years ago, but that one time radically benefited their life, set them in the right direction. You know, if their you know, therapeutic claims are palliative, like a lot of medications, you get the symptom relief, and you, know, you take it next time you need that symptom relief. So this is just like very different. There's plenty of cases where psychoactive substances cause permanent changes in someone's life, but they're almost all bad. Like you get really drunk and you kill someone in a car accident or you take too much cocaine and you have a, a stroke that affects your behavior going forward. It's like the, really the, the classic psychedelics are the only class of drugs that I have know of where there's these stories and some credible research consistent with that, but stories of plenty of people that they took this a few times and it led to help them in, in their creative thinking, like some of the tech folks like Steve Jobs, or that it's made them more, more artistically creative. Examples of musicians and artists, other artists are endless. And then there's claims that people say they stopped drinking. I eventually did research on this, but just surveys of folks that say they quit cocaine, alcohol, cannabis, tobacco smoke. It just There's all these kind of interesting stories of where people took this for fun or exploration, and then all of a sudden, they just had this profound aha moment. I use whatever it is way too much and just have making a pivotal change. And they're telling you the story 20 years later. That's, I went on about that, but that really encapsulates like, I'm interested in this as a tech, a technology of behavior change, these drugs and their powerful effects on the mind, which can have lots of risks and downsides as well, to be clear. Before we get into the clinical uses. For our listener, if you can just give us a, a little bit of an information about what psychedelics are, what are some of the classes, and then how do they actually work? Even amongst experts, no one agrees about the nomenclature, like what should we go, fall under what name. Many people use the word psychedelic more generally to include both what we call the classic psychedelics, which getting into brain talk, they're agonists, they activate the, the serotonin 2A receptor. So people probably heard of serotonin, one of the research brain neurotransmitters and also in the gut and in, in the body's addition to the brain. But a subtype of serotonin brain receptor is this type called 2A. And we know that the classic psychedelics activate that. That leads to downstream effects on other neurotransmitters like glutamate, and then ultimately has this effect on changing brain network activity to communication patterns across the brain. So that's how they, those work. But those are drugs like so the classic psychedelics, LSD, psilocybin, DMT, or dimethyltryptamine, which is in people may have heard of ayahuasca, the South American sacrament, mescaline, which is in peyote and some other cacti. Those are the prototypical classic psychedelics. Then you have MDMA, which is in another category. It's a serotonin releaser. has a different effect and, and side effect profile, but a good amount of overlap. And then drugs like the NMDA antagonists, the dissociatives, they're often called ketamine and PCP is also in that family, dextromethorphan, which is in a lot of cough syrup. So sometimes if you've heard of robo-tripping, teenagers yeah. taking too much of a cough syrup to have a psychedelic, that's dextromethorphan. It's a ketamine relative. So those are all, for some scientists that say we should only use the P word psychedelic for the classic psychedelics like LSD, psilocybin, et cetera. Others think it's a more general term, but yeah, that's what we mean by psychedelics. And I'd say even if you use it in the more general sense to include ketamine and MDMA, I would say subjectively and behaviorally, the thing that distinguishes psychedelics from sedatives and opioids and stimulants, other major classes of psychoactive compounds, is that psychedelic refers to this relatively large impact on one's sense of reality, including one's sense of self. It's like normal life, but everything's a little speeded up and you feel happier for no reason. That's a good description of cocaine and amphetamine. Or you feel like really sleepy, but cozy and good. That's You can explain some of these other drug classes that someone's never used any drugs because they're closer to regular reality. The psychedelic can have, I'm so sure the dose high enough, this really profound effect on people get very philosophical often. And they can basically go temporarily crazy. That's one can, in some sense, lose their mind. Their The normal constraints on the mind are lifted. And that can be a, a good or a bad thing, depending on your context. If you're trying to cross the street downtown, like, that's a really bad thing. And if, and if you have some mental instability, like with schizophrenia, it can be a very bad thing. But in some sense, the same sort of 
ability to majorly alter the operation of the mind, including one's even sense of who they are and what reality is. If if constrained with a prepared person, it seems like that kind of stepping outside of normal mental function can provide an opportunity to renormalize mental activity afterwards. But there's a lot to figure out. There's a lot of different lenses in terms of how this might be working. Right. And that's where we can um, talk about addiction because you want to renormalize something that's been fused into a habitual compulsive pattern. And and you're suggesting that can be changed. If I can just ask you a question, you listed drugs within this category of psychedelics, and it's the serotonin A2 receptor, is that what you said? 2A. Yeah, Yeah, 2A. Is that the same one that migraine medications work on as well? I live with a migraine uh, user who takes these meds, and she says she gets a bit of a boost. So I'm no I'm no neurologist, so I have yeah. limited knowledge. I always like to state that if I delve yeah, outside yeah. of my area. But my knowledge that like triptan, such yes. as sumatriptan, imitrex, the trade name, yes. is a ser I believe serotonin three um, three antagonist. Mm-hmm. I can't say that there aren't any. Typically in drug development, you avoid two A because even though there are some false positives, it's not uncommon for a two A agonist like the person starts tripping, and yeah. you normally don't want that. Yeah, well, let's start medication. Okay. There's some nuance there. So let's talk about how does tripping, how can we use that experience to change addiction? So please give us the framework. Yeah, I'd explain a bit of the biological understanding and where that's where we can speak to less reliably. There's a lot of hypotheses, but in terms of, we know a lot about what's happening acutely, meaning when the drugs, when the person's tripping, when they're having this other experience and there's been some brain imaging during that, there's pharmacology that speaks to that cascade of events. The real question biologically, which we're still figuring out, and there's only you know some good guesses, like, okay, what explains this change in behavior six months later if the person's less depressed or they've stopped drinking and they're no longer addicted to cigarettes, their PTSD is better? What explains that? Where we can say the most scientifically is at another level of analysis, the, the psychological or behavioral level. But to be clear, I don't believe that it, it's... Sometimes there's this question of, is it the mental effects or is it the bi- change in the brain? Presumably, these are two sides of the same coin. A drug that causes a mental effect, there's also a biological signature. This gets deep into the philosophy, but unless you're a dualist, you would see that these are just two sides of the same coin, that if there's an experience, there's probably, even if though we don't understand how, that, how it happens yet, if you think of your puppy, there's something biologically happened, even with a fleeting thought, even though we don't currently have the ability to pick up on that. We can only pick up on more molar gross patterns. What we can say more about is psychologically, when people have so-called mystical experiences, which is this concept, the description goes back to William James. The idea is actually describe something that's been described for centuries that through different techniques, not always drugs, but fasting, sometimes out of the blue, prayer, different meditative traditions that people can have this experience that's timeless and spaceless. And there's this disappearing of the normal psychological distinction between yeah. the subject and object, object. In other words, that you are a separate thing in the world interacting with other people and other things, that there's this kind of blurring of that and it's a unitive experience. All is one and you're part of that one. And so that can be described through different religious lenses or completely materialistic lenses in terms of an understanding of mental function. But it seems that type of experience has shown some a moderate correlation to whether they're benefiting in terms of less anxiety or depression or some symptoms indicating addictive behavior long term. I think the biggest story is that it's like when it works, it's essentially psychotherapeutic process. Whether or not you have a, a, a nominal psychotherapy, I've done research even on people who have, who have stories who took it for fun, one of these things for fun, but then they had this great aha moment realization. I'd say even under those circumstances, even though you're more likely to get that kind of aha realization with the intention and with some professional support, like whenever that type of thing happens, that's that's psychotherapeutic process, whether a, a therapist is present or not. Yeah. And it has these elements such as seeing oneself from a different perspective, the ability to step, at least temporarily, step outside of rigid ways of looking at the world. And we know that's very much the case in both depression and anxiety and the, the different addictions, like being it, stuck. It, the only way I'm going to feel better is if I use this. The, the world you know, hates me. I'm just a born a loser with depression or something bad is going to happen. It's all it's going to bad you know, in, in anxiety. All these ways are this rigid thinking. And so it seems that people can 
step outside of that, see themselves from a different perspective. They have oftentimes psychological insights. They have narratives that can tell you, oh, I saw my disorder from this different way. And I realized like, for example, I'm creating most of my suffering because I can still get out and enjoy life, but I'm not allowing my to do that. I still do that because of my cancer diagnosis. So it seems to escalate the therapeutic process. It sounds like that's what you're saying. Right. Even right. again, if a, a therapist isn't there, it's it looks like good psychotherapy when it works. Not just that it's treating symptoms, but it's, oh, I understand my problems more. And that can help me change the way I'm interacting with the world. You did some research on smoking and how psychedelic a therapy can help with smoking. And food addiction is very much like smoking. It's an ongoing, daily, low-grade, but very persistent compulsion. Can you give an illustration of how that might work? Psychotherapy, essentially. For addiction generally? or Food addiction, which I think is probably very similar to uh, smoking. That's endless, daily, yeah, ubiquitous exposure, et cetera. Yeah, I do think that and that needs to be research. I've been saying that for years. And if I'd had the funding for it, I would have already been pursuing this because it To me, the food addiction aspect is a really good example and a good test case for this, what I might call the generalized psychedelic efficacy hypothesis. The idea of what I just described, this increase in psychotherapeutic process where like even for like within addiction, normally a medication for addiction is pretty specific for opioids or nicotine. And usually it's either replacing, it's hitting the receptor that mediates that drug and it that quells your withdrawal, your craving for it in some more direct fashion. But the psychedelics work very differently. Yes, they have biological changes, but they seem to be ones that cause this qualitatively greater shift in mental function, allowing you to have these insights, but works more at the psychological roots. The interesting thing is there's some evidence now for tobacco, alcohol, and even some for cocaine addictions. And so that, that begs the question, oh, if it's the psychology of addiction beyond the surface level, like what you're addicted to, like which drug that obviously begs the question, okay, let's move outside of drugs, which as a behavioral psychologist is my assumption. Yes, there's something to the particular effects of this, that, or that drug. And so the withdrawal is going to look different, the intensity of withdrawal. But I've always been more focused about the commonalities across addiction. And so I think psychedelics get to commonalities by realizing It's more about this relationship between yourself and the world, how the overuse of this thing, which is good and pleasurable in the short term, is causing things to be bad in the long term. And that's a place with all these and obviously food addiction. What's interesting to me about food addiction that I think could be addressed, it's essentially it's a forced harm reduction approach. So using legal language, unlike these other addictions, you don't have the crutch of a bright line like okay, just don't smoke. Because obviously there's this disorder associated with just don't eat. So it's you can't get away from the cocaine, the alcohol. You can get away with those. But in the case of food, it's not. It's about bringing that relationship to be a healthy one. I really think the way this works, that this could help with food addiction. Because people could have, again, those psychological realizations. And we're still figuring out that biologically, this incre- temporarily increased ability to reestablish a new normal, putting the mind in a more plastic mode. And that may be unfolding based on some rodent research that may be unfolding not just during the session, but days or even weeks after the session through this kind of period where maybe there's this increased neuroplasticity, this increased adaptability in the nervous system. That might be a time under which it could help reestablish healthier eating patterns. Would you anticipate that to be something like on a regular weekly basis, or is it a one time off or maybe a two or three time thing, and then that, that might be enough? Probably the the latter. So that's the way most of the disorders now. It's a one, two, or three sessions, and it's not about having this every once in a while. Though I think you know the field, particularly for depression, which is the leading indication for psilocybin, in terms of being closest to potential FDA approval in a few years. Now there's more exploration and interest in. Yeah, maybe at least a subset of people. It's amazing that it helps some people. They're still better six months later, but if they're still depressed, can we give it to them two or three months later, six months later? It's probably going to be the case that at some frequency, the psychedelic treatments can be used more regularly. I I don't think it's ever going to be, unless you're talking about what's called microdosing, like trivial doses, it's never going to be used on a more of a daily basis because of the nature of it. My understanding is uh, from, is from working in addictions that people who use 
LSD MDMA, the tolerance develops very quickly. But if they're taking it on a regular basis, they have to start taking huge amounts, like by week three or week four. That's one of the, not the only, but one of the reasons why, even though these drugs can certainly be abused, used in a dangerous way, thankfully, the classic psychedelics don't appear to be drugs of addiction. People don't get into self-control issues, like with food or heroin or alcohol. Oh, I got to stop this or moderate this, but I'll, I'll start tomorrow. And, and then tomorrow yeah. comes and says, oh, oh, next week. Even animal models, we know they don't work in the brain rewards, dopaminergic pathway the same way that cocaine and alcohol, and even to a more moderate degree cannabis, with, which, which fits with the clinical picture, they can all hit that reward circuit more directly than yeah. the classic psychedelics, which is nice because there's always a concern with addiction, be it food or something else, if you have that addictive personality. And there's, I would say, some evidence for that generality, even though there's also evidence for specificity for what you're drawn to. Yeah, that's a reasonable concern. Am I just going to be addicted to mushrooms? And scientifically, that looks seems like a very low probability. All right. Well, uh, please speak to microdosing. Yeah, that's this idea of taking a dose of so low that you don't really feel it, or you feel it more at the level of a cup of coffee, not what we traditionally, traditionally think of as a psychedelic or even a strong psychoactive or intoxicating experience. But that's far less researched. So far, I'd have to say that the really credible studies have failed to validate the claims that people and there's a lot of different trends, like the more creative, they're less anxiety, they have less depression. A lot of people describe it like an ADHD drug, like an Adderall would be used, that it's, it keeps them focused, lets them get more work done. So far, none of that has been validated, although there could be some truth to that, and we just haven't looked at it the right way. But one of the practical things when people are doing this on their own is that sometimes people think the idea with microdosing is go about your life, drive to work, take care of the kids, all this they're at work and the walls start waving. You know, it's like, oh, whoops, I messed up and took too much. That's There's a number of concerns. And I always remind people, it might be in vogue, but it's also illegal. There have been there was news a couple of years ago, a few years ago, at some CEO in Silicon Valley where some of these things are really hip. He was talking about public microdosing and he was fired. His board's you're talking about schedule yeah. one drug use. <laughs> it doesn't, not a good show of wisdom. So there can be legal and professional consequences. This is all still very illegal. We talked about the different serotonin receptors. In addition to 2A, these drugs also, all the major psychedelics affect serotonin 2B, which is known for a, being a risk factor for heart valve disease. Fenfen, which connects to food addiction, was pulled off the market. It what was, was that? yeah. The, was it the late 80s or early 90s? specifically because one of the components of FinFin, one of the two drugs, was a two-drug combo, had agonist activity at serotonin 2A, which causes a, a hardening of the heart, of heart valve tissue, heart valve allopathy it causes. This is a well-known pathway. And so we don't know that chronically taking psychedelics puts you at risk at the clinical level, but there's really good reason to think at a certain dose, at a certain frequency, it very well might just because that mechanistic pathway that we know it activates is there. And, and, and the toxicologists and cardiologists aren't concerned at all if you take this thing two or three times, like in this kind of big dose treatment models where you take it and then we're seeing thankfully some benefit in, in a lot of people six months later. But if, it, if it's something where you have to take it three times a week or even every day, they say, now that is in the category where we need to be real cautious here. So that's another thing I like to warn people about. We just don't know yet, but it may be that taking a microdose of mushrooms or LSD every day is putting you at risk for heart disease. It almost sounds to me like, uh, if I'm reading you correctly, the um, macro typical dose on occasion might be um, have a better effect. Yeah, that's what we know most about. And frankly, it's what I'm most interested in scientifically. Because if the microdosing works, it's going to be more like a traditional psychiatric medication, which Nothing against them. I want more tools in the toolbox than fewer. But what I'm interested in is more of this paradigm shifting. And then it it's changing yes. the way you're thinking about things. And then microdosing looks more like Adderall or Prozac or Valium. You just take it to treat symptoms and take it on more of a regular basis. Now, can I challenge you here? I'm coming from a generation of previous trippers. Mm -hmm. And we had the experience of LSD. It was illegal, but everybody was doing it. Certainly there was paradigm shifts, but I saw lots of people who used that drug 
still go on and, and develop their heroin addiction or certainly their tobacco addiction, like nothing else changed other than that they said, yeah, I see the world in a different way. So how does that long lasting effect work? I'm guessing it's going to be, you need that guide. Like in the um, ayahuasca tradition, there's a guide that helps you. So please, mm-hmm. if you can elaborate on how can you make it from just being a favorable or bad trip into something that's actually therapeutic? Description of plenty of people using psychedelics and being addicted to other substances. That's a good example of that generality, that it's not that it more like other medications, it it directly affects the way alcohol feels or your response to alcohol. It's more of this deeper psychological level, which also says that if you're not looking to quit or maybe you don't have a problematic use pattern or just something that you accept and you're not really at conflict with using whatever substance at this level, there's some risk, but it's like driving a car and willing to accept it. There's really no conflict, what I would call is the heart of addiction, then you're not likely to get any behavior change because it's more about there's this ability to infuse this flex, flex of make whatever change is to be had. But if that's not a change, you're not going to get it. And I would also argue that's one of the downsides of having, I disagree with criminal prohibition of drugs as, as a way to effectively deal with the real problems of, of drug use. But nonetheless, having the psychedelic puts it in the same environment, the same person you might get your heroin from also has the LSD. And that's not good if people didn't have that, don't have that goal. For example, I've known plenty of people have said, man, I've been to a million dead shows. And yeah, that exactly. was the thing. You took acid or mushrooms. That's and those point. cigarettes were the most beautiful thing in the world. <laughs> There's nothing more enjoyable than smoking a cigarette when you're tripping. So people say it and they're, I, I totally believe them. Because again, it's not that... It's offering it at that deeper psychological roots level, which is depends on who you are and what is out of place and what you recognize as being out of place. Yeah. Can I just jump in there for just a second? I, this really, I recently went to Canada and did a guided experience with psilocybin mm-hmm. as well. And I would agree leading up to it, there was this whole protocol, right? We had meetings with our person. We had a protocol, like we had to set intentions. We had to meditate. 20 minutes a day on set intentions, right? The day of, there was like this whole fasting protocol. There was like, everything was just very like clinical. And I would imagine it can be intense and you could yep. feel like you're going to die, but you yes. know, so yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of education and then she remained with us during, and it was a group experience, whatever. Like there were many of us and she remained with us and talked us through different things. And then there was a, a like an integration piece mm-hmm. afterward, but I would agree had Had we not set those intentions, my entire feel on the whole thing would have been like, it would have just been like this trip and who knows what would have happened. Like, I'm a little, I'm actually like really scared to have that kind of experience because I know that my, like, I'm a person with CPTSD, anxiety, depression, all of those things. And so I worry about those things, but I didn't feel that way going into that experience. I think because of how it was set up and it was a macro dose experience, obviously, and it was very guided. It was very structured. And I think that's what you're saying is somebody can go to a dead concert and just want to be high, they have no inclination that stopping smoking is something I want to do because they're, they've already, those experiences are paired together, right? Oh, I'm going to go to the dead concert. I'm going mm-hmm. to get high and I'm going to smoke a cigarette and it's going to be the most amazing thing in my life. Why would mm-hmm. they want to change that? But when we went into this experience with intentions of help me to understand or help me to feel more love, whatever it might've been, right? Whatever people's intentions were, not one person, there were like eight of us and not one person that I remember came out of that saying I had a bad trip and I didn't have my intentions answered. So I think there, I, I love what you're saying. And I think there is a lot of value in, in like your work and in using psychedelics for some of these things, but I think it maybe needs to be structured. And I don't know, mm-hmm. maybe research is showing something different. With the caveat of that, we haven't done trials where it's structured versus unstructured. And in fact, I would argue we know enough through clinical observation over the decades that at the extremes, that would be an unethical experiment because we already know it can be really bad if it's if you didn't prepare someone. But we could do more sophisticated things by having to done feel like compare levels of preparation. Okay, if we think two hours is a minimum, all right, compare that to five hours and see if there's a difference. So we don't know, but it does seem that, and that's a very convincing that like you minimize the degree of difficulty. And I would say you don't eliminate a bad trip. And uh, clinically, uh, oftentimes, challenging experiences referred to with the idea that difficult is not necessarily bad. It could be bad or good in the long term. Someone could say that difficulty was 
a learning experience where it's like really tough to look at yourself in a certain way. Maybe it was processing some trauma that was really difficult and even scary, but that it benefited you. Yeah, the bad trip. That's a complex thing in and of itself. At a high dose, it seems no matter how well you prepare for someone, you can never eliminate the possibility. And it seemed actually at a high dose that about one third of people, even under these ideal prepared, supported mm-hmm. circumstances, about a third of the people say, yeah, at some point in time, I felt really scared or frightened or the anxiety was high. But I would also argue that respond pretty well to just reassurance, not with a stranger, which is why paranoia can creep up like at a concert, but someone that you really trust. If it's out in the non-clinical setting, whether it's a friend or in the clinical setting, a, a therapist that you train with for a few hours, at least before the session day, and that goes a long ways in helping someone not to turn it off, but help them to take a more mindful approach to recognize like, yes, this is difficult, but I'm staying with it. I'm not going to catastrophize the experience. I'm just going to observe it and move yeah. through it. That's I, difficult. easier said than done. For sure. I know I have an experience of a friend who took a very high dose and was on her own and got that paranoia and was not able to bring herself down. And she became psychotic, which is essentially what you said yourself. Yeah. It's a level of psychosis. Trust your physical safety because like, maybe you can't. Like, yeah. Or you, you think, oh, I might run outside and have to go to my neighbors that don't, they would be horrified if I was taking this substance or or the police are going to come. These are actually real things that can, there was a fire in, at a concert, like, yeah, someone can take your purse or your wallet. Like you can get sexually assaulted. So there's a reality. You're not supposed to let your guards down radically. And that's what this is. Letting your guards down radically. You need to be very wise about the settings in which you do that. And and the people And even in the therapy world, which is another thing, there's a risk of inappropriate, especially the development of sexual relationships because of the level of intimacy that you really are letting those guards far down. It is makes it really important that we focus on clinical boundaries and to make sure that so one is wise to be only in a really safe setting physically and interpersonally. Give me an ideal person, client, that you think this would be a good approach. And somebody that you would say, no, this person should not. The things that we eliminate for and really across most of the field, well, I would say here's one for across the entire field, is people with either active psychotic disorder, schizophrenia is the biggest example of a psychotic disorder, or an identifiable predisposition. Maybe they don't have the full diagnosis yet, but you can do this through psychiatric interviewing. And there's a lot of factors like, okay, especially if you have a close relative, because there is some heritability with psychosis predisposition. It's not a guarantee, but it increases that likelihood. And if you had some early symptoms and especially your age, it is it is possible to develop it when you're older in life. But the modal time of first break is in the teens or early adulthood. So maybe you just haven't had your first break yet. So if there's any suspicion someone's in that they're really vulnerable to psychotic disease, the last thing you need is a, a psychedelic. There are some, I would say, clinical observation that like, yeah, it seems pretty convincing to me that it can destabilize someone. Or somebody who's using a lot of crystal meth or cannabis together. I see that a lot of psychosis happening there. Are they a candidate? So there's a lot of questions like to oh. unpack there because in the research world, we, of course, we need to usually start clean. So it's like either meth or <laughs> cannabis. Okay. But well, the combo is pretty deadly. So you never get... These complex answers, unfortunately, which is a bit actually a big problem in drugs because the clinical case is usually multiple disorders and addiction to multiple drugs, this type of thing. But we don't really know. I would, my best guess is that for that person, it's going to be important to withdraw from those, which thankfully stimulant withdrawal isn't anywhere near as bad as uh, opioid withdrawal or sedative withdrawal, alcohol withdrawal, for example, but to have them not used for the past week or two. And for them to pat, like, look psychi- psychiatrically stable so that it was convincing that any symptoms like that were a part of, of their ongoing acute use. So you probably want to normalize, wash them out, especially of the math or whatever stimulant cocaine. Again, that's in a research study where we'd still have our clinical radar up. Of, oh, if something gets worse, we're going to know it right away. We even have the ability to like, halt the trial if we think we're learning something new about making people worse on those disorders. So it'd have to be very cautiously looked at, but it's not just mental. There's heart disease. So if you're more at the severe levels of heart disease, not, and we've dosed plenty of people with controlled hypertension, but if it's someone who 
is like at that level where the doctor says, yeah, don't take the stairs at work, don't shovel snow. Yeah, it's it's a you're at some risk of doing anything that raises your blood pressure even modestly. And psilocybin and MDMA both do MDMA somewhat more. Um, so they raise your pulse and your blood pressure, typically pretty modest and no issue for most healthy people without heart disease. But then there's there's other things that are still at the forefront. Like it seems like personality disorders, certain ones are should be probably contraindicated that it might be exacerbate something like borderline personality disorder. And there's also something that I think we don't appreciate much and it's hard to quantify and it's something I'm becoming increasingly interested in is just maturity and obviously correlated with age, but not <laughs> perfectly. There's the 60 year old completely immature person versus the that old soul that might be 20. But something about being mature and to be able to fully benefit from these experiences. So I think that's important in a number of ways because it's also such a dramatic thing. It has to be grounded. Something like a young person falling in love for the first time or other. One can become swept away, I think, even too much. And there is a concern, I would say, about the cultogenic aspect of, in this field where an experience is just an experience and there's something important about remaining grounded. And well, that's not like the whole rave any, ecstasy thing, right? Yeah. You know, like people take an MDMA at a rave yeah. or okay. it's, yeah, you shouldn't lower your boundaries with a bunch of, yeah, there really are some creepy dudes out there. You know, be very cautious and wise about where you choose to lower these boundaries. But our typical um, food addiction client, who's probably most likely female, not always, but most likely, and probably middle-aged, not always, but most likely, and they're fed up, they're tired, they have the intention, they might be a good candidate. Yeah. Of course, I'll always like the caveat, I don't encourage any use of anything, even caffeine, but I do, whether it's like people interested in potential clinical trials involvement, or if they're going to, don't encourage it. But if someone's going to use in a, in, a, in any of the other settings, and there's all broad landscape from re, from retreats to just underground therapists and everything. But I do think in all of those contexts, it's important to know. Okay, here's the riskier use, and one and you know everything has risk, but here's less risky use when you're not around strangers, when you have some type of really experienced support, and when there's one is, has a good signal that they're truly safe in the experience. And then in terms of whether it's someone's likely to get clinical benefit, I've done a lot of survey research of you know people taking it on their own or in these other circumstances. I'm very interested in any setting is more likely to create a beneficial experience. And it does seem that a lot of those factors we have at play in the study, like when they have intention and when they're you know not looking just to party. Although you do definitely get cases of someone takes it just to party and then they have one of these life-changing, that happens uh -huh. Too, I, I think it's you're just it's you're turning up the gain, like the likelihood of one of these big picture life changing aha experiences. If you take it seriously, build intentions, allow yourself to let go, or not forced to be in a so even if it's like a fun party yeah. setting, dancing. What about uh, if you're on medications like antidepressants, which are serotonin based as well? Is that a contraindication or other meds? So there's more scientifically there's more of a concern that I mean there's always an unknown drug interaction that hasn't been discovered yet but that caveat aside there's more of a scientific concern with that you're going to have a a reduced response with if you're an antidepressant because you like there's been this regulation of the receptor that's that less receptors are available and so you're going to have less of a of an effect because of that the serotonin system has been bombarded and so it's adjusted by tucking in the receptors. And there's actually some conflicting evidence. And so I think we, the jury's still out whether that attenuation happens. or. But that's more the concern that you're going to have less of the effect rather than in, with dangerous, like overly intense. And is that also of the antipsychotics as well? So you know, there is some experience. evidence that with one of the antipsychotics that the, the effects of psilocybin can be intensified. So huh. There's a lot that's unknown with, especially like, like in a lot of areas, even with approved drugs, there's a lot that's unknown in the drug interaction world. Because even in the clinical trials, it's, you know, no one knows, even when you get three or more, and then you have people on eight, 10, a dozen drugs. And it's, there's never been, I, there may never have been a, a person in the world on those exact same 12 drugs at that, much less a clinical trial at those exact doses for this exact length of time. It's like, Whenever we're getting into drug interactions, I'm always, my recommendation is to stay very humble. And unless it's known that it's safe, 
you don't have evidence that it is safe. Another question, we have big cannabis. We have the cannabis industry that's funding research, and they're very motivated to push as, as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Are we, could we see the potential of this happening with the pharmaceuticals to adopt psychedelics and then push them in the same way? We can therefore not trust what they say? Yeah, so I would say it's a very different given the policy and just regulatory legal landscape in the sense that one good thing, if you're concerned about the, you know, whatever big psychedelic, big cannabis, big tobacco or big farm having an insidious grip on everything and pushing their products. And it's one of the better things about psychedelics is that it is through the FDA pathway. Now, there Uh, is some noise here because some states, Oregon and Colorado, have passed or have somewhat of a state level regulated non-medical use system. But most of the companies in the space where you're going to get big, whatever the corporate influence is through the FDA process, which so with cannabis, it was ultimately all about most of the action is like setting up like, what do you call it? cannabis shops, whatever they're in, in the States, whether it's medical, recreational, and it's that's a very different pathway from spending many millions of dollars to get something FDA developed, and then you're subject to the rules. So it's going to of the FDA, and but you do then have those general concerns, so-called big pharma, they have all those rules too. <laughs> and so I would say... There's too much influence over pharma, over FDA decision making. There should be more of a prohibition between a revolving door. Like, I think you shouldn't be able to go from the FDA to one of these companies, except if it's some very large length. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of problems there. But it, so I don't want to say there's no problems. But relative to cannabis, there's a lot of the safety of having that federal level regulation as a medicine. But so- time will tell like how. There's always going to be negative aspects of, but overall, that's not enough. Some people look at this and say, I don't want psychedelics developed as a medicine because they don't trust the hierarchy. They don't trust from any number of lenses, but this can help a lot of people if we use it right and are very careful in how it's regulated and used clinically. Okay, good. So in the larger picture, how do you see things developing? And in that development, what cautions would you like to see? So I think FDA is going to be close to approving some of these compounds. In fact, they could, even though it may not happen. They could potentially approve MDMA for the treatment of PTSD in August. But regardless of whether that happens or not, we're still within the next few years of both MDMA and psilocybin likely being approved, as well as soon after that, like a number of other psychedelics. One of the things I'd like to see is, I think we're going to have approval of a number of these. I think there's going to be a lot to figure out with different treatment models, like where the companies are actually able to make money and stay on market because they're, from one perspective, there may be more of a business and service delivery and we don't have nearly enough therapists trained to do this. Um, so on the business side, how is this going to be deployed in critical questions? Is there going to be insurance coverage, Medicare coverage? There's probably going to be a development of similar like state level programs like Oregon and, and Colorado for some type of use. That's probably going to be relatively limited. I I don't think it's going to grow as fast as cannabis. I think there's probably going to be more of a wait and see because psychedelics are more intense than cannabis in many respects. I think the main pathway that's going to be developed is through the FDA. And eventually, I see psychedelics is probably emerging into this kind of class of non-therapeutic what positive health enhancing substances. And I think these examples are just growing and that federal government is going to have a way to, they're going to have to adopt and regulate these things, like from everything from like life extension, even starting back with like erectile dysfunctions. Okay, they had a drug with this effect. And it's like, okay, let's create the disorder. Is it a really disorder? Is, is all of that use to treat true? There's a performance like the ADHD medication. There's all these performance enhancing I would argue a good amount of that line for like testosterone re- replacement is that how much of this is really treating a disorder versus it just, yeah, you're more optimal. I think there's going to be a, like this growing focus over the decades. Someone gave me a recent example of Rogaine and yeah. growing hair. Was like, well, that really a disorder? So there's this whole class of just like, life improving substances that with key questions are like everything has risk. And so how do we yeah. regulate that? With Prozac, we call it the cosmetic pharmacology. Yeah. So even with the antidepressants, there was an aspect of that. Now, this has been argued by plenty where the people that were giving it to now, a good chunk wouldn't have been diagnosed with depression yeah. in the 1970s or 70s. That There's been an evolving 
probably too much. Like sometimes it's you're sad not to dismiss it, but yeah, maybe you're in a bad job that's making you not happy or a bad relationship. You're supposed to be sad sometimes. That's a like a self correction signal. And so it's is that a part of it? Like maybe you want to be happy all the time. It doesn't sound like good, good advice, but I do think that over the decades, like psychedelics and probably more, even more advanced things that are having just more remarkable effects on the mind, these kind of radical ways of altering human functioning. And it's going to be pretty wild. I don't know what the, the answer. I, I think the more we can get ahead of it and inform risk and just provide education to people and the, the better. Definitely. Yeah. I think that, I don't know, you sound a little more hopeful about the FDA approving MDA than I've been reading into it. And I guess that was that would be my question is knowing that psilocybin is a few years down the road, if it doesn't go well for the MDMA in August, do you suspect that will be problematic for psilocybin in the next few years? I don't even think it's going to be problematic for MDMA in the next few years. It really most of the question are the problems are not just inherent to it being a psychedelic. I know about a lot about yeah. the research and about the process. I don't see and I'm always up for a good conspiracy. I'm, I don't see any smoke filled room here. It's yeah. most of the questions real are about some of the the ways that the the sponsor decided to run the study and right. they used a non standard psychotherapy which is raising these questions and also some weird regulatory things like they did use specifically psychotherapy psychotherapy as a backdrop but fda isn't they're not mandated they're not charged they don't have really arguably the legal authority to regulate the practice of psychotherapy now that gets a little there's gray areas okay indicating the clinical ways in which a drug is administered they can have rules around that with a drug like this there's a gray area of what's technically psychotherapy and what's preparing for this drug experience to make it safe so it gets complicated, but I think the advisory panel raised a lot of concerns that the FDA has already made a decision or already knows we're not going to DQ this because if they had the same psychotherapy in both groups, it is what it is. We're looking at the drug response above and beyond that, which is the way they've set it up. So it may be that they don't weigh some of those issues that the ad advisory panel brought up. The other thing is blinding that most mm -hmm. people correctly guessed what can, and they, but the what can did whether they got the drug or the placebo, but the FDA has been clear in my experience and the experience with others, including these pre phase three meetings, apparently with the spot MDMA sponsor, Lycos, formerly MAPS, that they know the blinding issue is not going to be perfectly solved. But here's what they'd be satisfied with in implementing a double blind and having independent, especially for something like I would imagine it would be different for addiction where you can actually have like urine tests, et cetera. But something like depression or PTSD, that you have independent clinicians serving as ra blinded raters. So they had all of that in place. And so the ad, the scientists who are more regular, they're not working for the FDA, but they're they're paid. A, I've done this for NIH as reviewers and whatnot. You take a science, you fly them in, you pay them usually some pretty low rate amount, but it's more about being as part of that scientific process. And they don't necessarily know what the FDA has already decided. And in fact, some of them said, I know you all, they, they indicated they knew they were not supposed to regulate therapy, but they still didn't know how to, I think, handle this. But there's other things. For example, there's this cult like vibe that caused this downplaying of there was the one very public phase two sexual relationship that yeah. developed, which is an example right. of what I was warning you about. You were talking earlier. about that exactly. There are apparently some other cases where there's apparently some claim that there was a serious adverse event that then wasn't recorded by the treatment team. Maybe mm -hmm. I don't have knowledge about. Apparently, there's still investigation of that stuff. It did seem like death by a thousand cuts. Yes. And the vote was pretty overwhelming, nine to two and then 10 to one on the two slightly. So, yeah, I don't know. I probably would say it's probably more closer to 50 50 than most people might guess having seen that. But I don't know whether I'd be voting in favor of it at this point. But if it is, I really don't think it means that the sponsor might have to go back and do more work and other companies developing sure. MDMA or, or similar drugs may come back with having run things a different way, address some of these issues. I, I really don't think there was any of this bias. We can't let psychedelics be approved. The FDA has actually been, I think, pretty commendable with like really welcoming this, hey, we're treating this anything else. It's got to meet these standards of safety and efficacy. I've been more like pleasantly surprised that there is a pathway forward. Yeah. And it sounds like you're feeling confident about the psilocybin research and trials that they're hitting the marks. It may be that 
some of those companies developing for depression, that they're doing some squirrely stuff that might come up that I would just encourage everyone, including phase three researchers, to collect all the data the FDA wants. Apparently, there was one request for collecting euphoria, which basically means drug liking. Do you feel high? Does this feel good? Like we know that some, like you're going to get that with MDMA. So I wouldn't hope this would be a make or break issue, but apparently the FDA wanted that the sponsor didn't collect it. There's an argument there. And then you push back and if there's a reality there, they, they'll, they compromise on things and there's a path to negotiate these things and bring up concerns about designs. I don't see anything fundamentally that biases against just psychedelics where psychedelics can never be approved. This seems to be more of, okay, how you ran this trial. I think this FDA advisor panel was filled with lessons. Like every drug sponsor in the psychedelic industry out there is taking <laughs> fastidious notes. Okay, we're learning a lot here about how to get it through next time. So I wouldn't make strong bets on any one particular sponsor, but over whether one of these or multiple psychedelics are going to be passed in the next few years, I think it seems very likely just given the strength of the data. And my hope is that the FDA applies a really smart, good set of uh, REMS, the rules that the risk valuation mitigation strategies, the rules, keep it in the clinic, provide the preparation, whatever they're landing in terms of the rules, like questions about how many therapists need to be there and whether you need two licensed therapists in the room and all that. But they land on a fairly reasonable set of rules that keeps Quite frankly, the out there clinicians who are going to do this the wrong way, including the unethical, the, yeah. to minimize and stop, if at all possible, Definitely. any of that monkey business and keep this like really like safe for people. Definitely. We have one final question if you're up for it. Sure, sure. It is our signature question. So if you could tell yourself, a younger version of yourself, anything about psychedelics, psychedelic treatment, research, any of that. What would it be? I never think I was total, totally down the rabbit hole on the opposite of this, but I'll, I'll say people that are either interested in psychedelics or even have some of these you know, very positive exper- therapeutic experiences with psychedelics or people that use religiously and have... Psychedelics don't make people better people. You have the whole range of humanity. And I think under some circumstances, yes, people could come to some realizations. You can take good people and... They can put some things together and they can maybe be even better people if they change themselves in a particular way. But this is a very powerful technology. And I'm more worried than I was at a younger age, like back in my I guess, late 20s when I got into this area. I had more appreciation for some of these bigger picture harms that can emerge. This is almost like how are we going to deal with splitting the atom or AI? Is it going to unleash a lot of good and a lot of bad? Yeah. And when you have a technology that can powerfully influence the mind, like that's just very humbling. And so just watch out. You're going to see like with any religion or which is a part of this, because it's by some people's description and access to the divine, to God, whatever, by some people's description. And so anything like that can be leveraged. You want to be very cautious about there's plenty of unethical people surrounding both psychedelics, including scientists and psychedelic like religious users. And there's a lot of really good people too, but it's just, they're just people. So that's the thing I'd want to tell my earlier younger self and obviously folks out there. (laughs) Wise words of wisdom. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. It was a great conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. My pleasure. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals who offer one-to-one counseling and group coaching through Sweet Sobriety. Please subscribe to our show so you never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in today's episode, we'd appreciate you leaving us a review on your favorite platform. Your feedback helps grow our show and allows us to reach others who need to hear this message of recovery. Don't forget to pick up a copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies. And as Vera always says, the power is ours.